Okay, so welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed your uh, lunch. Um, we are moving into the first panel session of the afternoon um, and I'm really excited about this. I think it's a slightly different uh, kind of feel from the sessions that we've had uh, in the morning in that we are going to be talking about um, financial innovation through payments technology and it's true to say I think that across the world governments uh, and public bodies are moving away from traditional paper processes uh, in terms of using uh, making payments to kind of really embracing some of the different technologies that are out there and this can really help in increase the efficiency of the way they make payments it can reduce the errors making sure that they're paying to the right people we've had, heard a little bit about that in sessions already um, but also massively reduce the costs for government of doing uh, some of these payments. So we're going to be talking about all things payments uh, in this session. Um, I know it's the after dinner session, um, so we need lots of energy in the room. So I will be coming to you for great questions. So please do take this opportunity, because we have three brilliant speakers here. Um, so be thinking about the questions you want to put to our speakers, and I'll make sure we have time at the end of the session to get to your questions. So first, we will be hearing from Alessandro Morica, who is Chief Executive at Pago PA, so am I saying it right? Pago PA. Yes, yeah, Pago PA, um, which is the national payments platform in Italy. So you're going to be telling us um, a bit more about that. Then we will hear from Lee Edmonds, who is head of payment services at the financial services in the Crown Commercial Service uh, in the UK. And then last but by no means least, because he's come a long way to be with us here today, we're going to hear from Sudansu Prasad, <coughs> who is the Chief General Manager at the Reserve Bank of India, where there has been lots of work going on on kind of payments and technology. Alessandro, I'm really, really curious to hear what's going on in Italy on this payment platform. Yeah, so uh, I will have a very short uh, speech, only 20 minutes, so it's <laughs> I, I, 80 slides, so really... <laughs> I'll cut you off For after, the, after lunch, it will be perfect. <laughs> fine, fine. Uh, so I'm uh, representing Pagopia. Uh, Pagopia means uh, uh, I pay public administration. Uh, not to confuse with Paga Pia, uh, Paga Pa, which in Italy, uh, young people in Italy are using to say uh, daddy is paying. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> okay. something a little bit different. So uh, Pagopia is a state-owned company. Uh, established in uh, five years ago, so it's a very new company uh, that operates autonomously uh, as a technical partner and advisor to be public, administ uh, public institutions with the logic of self-sustainability. So we are, um, we are trying not to be financed by the state. Uh, our mission is to design and build uh, to build uh, digital infrastructures and advanced uh, uh, technological solutions aimed at promoting the widespread diffusion of simple user-centric uh, digital citizen services starting from the digital payments. So digital payments are one part and this was the, uh, why the company was established uh, to strengthen the national payments uh, uh, system uh, which is where, from which, uh, through which the, all the uh, money transactions addressed to the Italian public uh, bodies are, are transiting and is among the uh, e-government pillars in Italy. Uh, promoting and enabling uh, digital payments is a cross-cutting goal of, our plat of all our platforms. All of these, so you can see them on the, on the slide, uh, all of these are contributing uh, to building a digital and interconnected uh, public administration ecosystem covering all the strategic functions of the, city, uh, of the state citizen relationship. So, the management of data, so we are managing the data hub uh, of all the uh, data platforms in Italy. Uh, the um, communication, so also all the letters uh, with um, uh, legal value that are sent to the, to, uh, to the people. Uh, will be sent in the future because we have just started the platform through, uh, through digital mm -hmm. but in the case in which the people are not digital with the normal, uh, the normal ways, so by post. Uh, the notification, so also the notification through, uh, through our app, uh, Appio, that you see on the, uh, on, on the slide, uh, which is uh, used for the, uh, all the public administrations to uh, speak and to address issues to the, uh, to the citizen. 
So, uh, and also to address eventually payments if, if needed. Payments, so Pagopia, so we, the first platform we started. And welfare, which is a platform which is allowing uh, the uh, public administrations to, uh, to give bonuses, to give incentives to the people to be used on, the, uh, on any vendor in Italy, as we are covering all the POS uh, um, of, uh, of Italy with our system. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, adopted uh, synergistically uh, with the same standards and the same simplified experience for all entities, all, all uh, our platforms produce efficiency, innovation, and value for all players in the ecosystem. Uh, where did we start from? And here I will focus on the, on the payment platform, in fact. Uh, before introducing it, the Italian tax collection system was a very complex one, highly fragmented, made up of 23,000 entities, and of these uh, 23,000 entities, consider that there are 9,000 9, schools and uh, approximately 8,000 um, uh, local municipalities, of which the 70%, 70 percent, yes, are below 5,000 uh, inhabitants. So very small, um, how to say, uh, municipalities with a lot of uh, governance pro uh, problem and knowledge problems, competences, especially um, digital and IT competences missing. Uh, and all of these 23,000 entities uh, have different technologies, systems, procedures, and forms of payment. So in fact, each of them had, uh, for example, the, an agreement with one bank, and the, inhabit, uh, and the citizen had to go to this bank to pay uh, without the possibility of choice, and everything was uh, eventually uh, absolutely uh, analogic. Uh, this, of course, was generating big inefficiencies, uh, mainly in terms of cost, waste of resources, and poor quality of the government services. So, um, really not the, <laughs> not the best solution to start. In this context, Pagopia, uh, as Pagopia, we provided technological solutions to simplify the work of the public administration, especially the smaller ones, that were the more critical ones, uh, ensure, and ensure better efficiencies, quality, and sustainable processes, generating, generating significant time and uh, cost savings. Uh, moreover, thanks to the cooperation with, uh, with the um, payment service providers, we jointly identified the best solutions for the public administration and for the citizens. And in our role uh, of intermediary, we ensure a direct link between the government and the private companies taking care of digital, uh, for, for the small and for, in fact, all the public administrations, contributing to make the public sector a more attractive uh, environment, realizing synergies that produce benefits for citizens, markets, and country. And, and nowadays, all our 410 uh, payment service providers are con uh, that are connected through Pagopia are producing the same kind of uh, simple bill uh, layout with the same clear and standard information, regardless of the type of payment or the entity that is asking for the payment. Uh, the, the results of this revolution, I would call it, uh, that has started, uh, in fact, eight years ago, but as I mentioned, the company has five years only, uh, has pro um, are remarkable and uh, uh, for the public administration, thanks to the integration between the platform, the payment platform, and the EO platform I mentioned before, uh, which is used as the mobile front end, and all users can pay uh, for the public services directly also from their smartphones. So at the end, what are the big benefits that we, we have uh, created? Accelerated payments. Uh, for instance, we have evidences that uh, from the bigger municipalities that 50% of the payments for traffic fines, for example, are paid on the same day in which the, uh, the, the citizen has received the, the, the notice. And also the time of uh, receiving the notice has been accelerated from three months to a couple of days. So uh, also um, what, what was a problem in Italy was, uh, was the fact that people were receiving the bill, uh, the, the fine so late that they, were, they forgot about uh, having done something mm -hmm. wrong. 
Now also the fact that we are receiving this much earlier is, is a much more educative than, uh, than the situation we had before. Uh, high receipts, uh, the entities are increasing, uh, have increased the actual amount of collection up, up, to, uh, up to 40%. HR savings, uh, especially in the big administrations, um, I, be, I mean big municipalities as Lomo or Milan, up to 10, P, uh, 10 FTEs can be better employed in each of them, of course, not in, not in total, uh, in more valuable activities uh, than manual reconciliation of, and reporting. And higher sustainability, of course, we are saving a lot of paper, but mm. it's not only a saving on the, um, on the entity side, so on the public administration side, but also on the citizen side, uh, who is saving time, saving fuel, not, uh, not, not having to go to a specific place to pay, and so on. Uh, summing up, we offer a uniform user experience across all touch points in a multi-channel perspective allowing the freedom of choice to pay where and how, to, uh, how um, people want, even in uh, uh, physical touch points as tobacco shops, for example, uh, helping to break down the digital divide that has historically characterized our country. Uh, the proof of our success are our, our numbers. Uh, in, 2000, uh, yeah, in 2024, an average of 12 and a half million people uh, uh, each month are paying through our platforms uh, from, uh, to about 18,000 entities that have already um, joined our platforms. And uh, as of April 20, uh, 2024, we generated almost 1.2 1 billion uh, transactions for an economic value of approximately uh, 238 billion euros. So, uh, definitely, it's something which is central and that has addressed uh, the digital divide issues, giving the opportunities to everybody. Brilliant. Alessandra, thank you so much. Really good to have that actual um, use case example and amazing how much progress has been made in such a short space of time Absolutely. and what you're now able to see. And also, really, in, I mean, you've set out really clearly all the benefits of this, but very interesting that you started with payments in to government. And now that platform is being used for so many other things for government. So it's driving transformation Absolutely. across lots of other areas. And in fact, the, the platforms I presented are only a part of what we are doing yeah. because we are just another example. We are working on a, on a digitalization of the bank guarantees uh, to allow also the, uh, how to say, to, to follow the history of all the guarantees and to address also the frauds problems yeah. in the public administration. Fantastic. I've got questions already that I'll come back to. I'm going to hold them at questions around the digital divide and also maybe digital IDs and how that all fits in and everything. But thank you so much. Please be thinking about your questions. I'm going to throw it back out to you as well. But Lee, coming over to you. Hi, everybody. I've, um, I've decided to stand up for two reasons. One, um, because I've got two incredible colleagues with me. Uh, I had to do something to make my presentation <laughs> interesting. And secondly, colloquially speaking, we call this the pudding session, so dessert, um, and to get some energy in the room, hopefully, anyway. So my name's Lee Edmonds. I'm Head of Payment Services within Crown Commercial Service, and I'm just going to take you on a little bit of a journey about what Crown Commercial Service is, first of all. Crown Commercial Service is a public sector buying organisation, the largest in the UK. We're part of the Cabinet Office within the UK, but we're an executive agency. We're self-funding, we generate all of our income through the work we do with the private and public sector organisations. So what does that mean? What we do effect is generate market intelligence to create umbrella contracts and digital marketplaces that allow public sector organisations to leverage best value from private sector partners. So we understand the market, we understand who has the capability, capacity and ethics to be able to deliver to the public sector, and we procure overarching frameworks to enable them to do that. So in practice, some of our results from the last financial year, we're still dealing with the books at the moment for this one, 31 billion was spent through our commercial agreement. So we are a trusted provider for public sector entities within the UK. Um, 11.5 billion from the wider public sector, so that includes organisations such as local authorities, ambulance trusts, and actually charities as well who are able to use our agreements. And critically, we delivered 3.8 billion in commercial benefit. So what does that mean? Essentially, that's a quantifiable measure of the value that we've added to the public sector in that year 
through them utilising the services through Crown Commercial Services. Here's the interesting bit. We've got 20,000 customers. So this is really, really tricky. Not 20,000 individuals. Our customers are entities. So that's 20,000 individual entities within the UK that form part of the public sector that <coughs> utilise Crown Commercial Services. And 3,000 different suppliers that are working with us as well. So I'm just going to leave that, that thought in your mind for a moment because we'll talk about challenges later. So in the payment services in my world, so I look after everything that's non-core banking. And again, it's about developing products, solutions, services, market intelligence, routes to market that the public sector can use working with payments providers. So today's about innovation, but in the public sector, we can't just look at innovation in isolation. We have to think about value creation ultimately. So on the wheel on the, uh, your left hand side, I've looked at some key considerations that we think about when looking at innovative technology. We've got to think about cost efficiency, yes, but we've got to think about things like choice, quality, inclusion, social value. So actually, who is innovation working for? What do we mean by innovation? We had some good conversations about the relativity, relativity and relevance of innovation. Uh, but actually, do innovative products cater for everybody or do we need to think differently about different cohorts and segments and sections of society as those who work in the public sector? Some of the key things we've been working on, and I use innovation in a sense of not necessarily the products, but the way in which we execute the products is innovative within the UK public sector. So recently we've developed an open banking marketplace. And essentially what that is, is a digital marketplace that allows any public sector organisation to access pre-qualified organisations that can deliver payment initiation service, account information service or confirmation of payee services. They're the three fundamental products and services that are accessible. HMRC are currently working with us to procure their, their next round of services through that open banking framework. Some obvious benefits from, from open banking in terms of reduced costs, reduced back office re reconciliation as a result of account to account payments, enhanced for pre uh, prevention and informed decisions, fantastic. But as I said, open banking isn't for everyone and actually we've got around about 5 million households in the UK who are unbanked, so how do we cater for them? Well the third arrow is prepaid cards and vouchers, so I heard Karen talking about smart cards this morning in Ireland. That's something that we've put into place through a, a framework, a marketplace that enables public sector buyers to procure services through those providers who can provide solutions that are actually either physical or digital in this uh, space, but ensure that regardless of whether or not an individual's got a bank account, we can get money into the hands of vulnerable people. Some really positive case studies. Um, a famous footballer for a football team that I won't mention in the UK. During, um, during the summer of, of the last couple of years has put together a campaign which looks at children whose parents are in receipt of benefit who qualify for free school meals during term time. How do they feed those kids outside of school? So a welfare package was developed which looked at providing funding to put food into the bellies of, of those children ultimately and that's delivered through vouchers so closed loop vouchers that are available for use at supermarkets that are delivered to the hands of those parents. So driving behaviour to use funds in a specific way via a voucher. And those vouchers are issued physically, but if individuals have digital capability, they're issued via QR code or digital vouchers. So building on existing convention and technology in the gift card market, for example. Prepaid cards offering a different solution. Open loop prepaid cards are enabling local authorities, munis municipalities, easy for me to say, in the UK to get money out to citizens who don't want to be paid into a bank account. Those responsible, for example, for paying for social care. Children in care who are given allocations of funding. They want to be able to spend money but don't want to stand out from their crowd because somebody's having to buy clothes for them. So create an inclusive action and activity within the social care sector through payments, products and services. So the way we're looking at this is fantastic innovation that caters for the mainstream, but actually we've got a, a duty of care and responsibilities to think about how we do not create a broader digital divide, mm -hmm. how we can utilise existing digital and physical solutions to get money into the hands of vulnerable people. But back down to the wheel, social value, 
a bit of a shameless plug for some of the work that we've been doing in this space with regards to social mobility, which I will define as, as simply as somebody's heritage shouldn't define their, their legacy. We've been working with large financial institutions, credit reference agencies to think about how we educate children, how we at school age start to develop an understanding of financial literacy that isn't naturally present within the curriculum or within their peer groups or families. So how do we educate them to use digital products and services? But crucially, not just use the services, make informed decisions about using those services. Part of the work that we do and the contracting arrangements we have in place, and in fact the law, the Social Value Act, means that suppliers to the UK government have to deliver social value as part of their contracting obligations. And what we do is work with suppliers to look at ways in which they can create a financially inclusive environment. So beyond the service that they're delivering, what can they do? So at base level, this has been the large financial institutions working with us and school-aged children, providing financial management skills, budgeting skills, financial education that is outside of the school. Simple things that start to make a difference and help them make informed decisions, not just what product or service do I use, in what circumstance, what is the impact, what is the knock-on effect critically. And that, for me, is really, really crucial in ensuring that we don't create not just a digital divide, but, but a debt problem through taking on credit that actually is, is taken on through uninformed decision making. And then finally, one that's a little bit odd, I guess, for this forum, one of the areas that we're working on at the moment is fuel payments. So at the moment, we've got a standardised product, which is a fuel card. We've around about 5,000 organisations in the public sector that use fuel cards, ambulance services, police, fire services, for example, but all sorts of fleets, and they use a fuel card to pay for fuel. Uh, the, the clues in the name but actually as we move to electric vehicles and alternative fuels that standardized infrastructure that supports those payments is no longer in place so one of the things that we're working on at the moment which will be really innovative is how are we going to pay for that we can't go back to a situation where we have invoices pay and reclaim people footing bills and claiming back expenses so what are we going to do in this space so we're doing a lot of outreach, working across different industries and different sectors to understand the current horizon, the landscape, what is the industry view, what is the public and private sector view of how this problem is going to be solved moving forward. And again, looking at really innovative solutions beyond the mainstream that we usually deal with. I'm conscious of time, have I run out? You've got 30 seconds if you need. I've got 30 seconds, I'll just talk about a little bit about the challenge and I'll just say the three words. You can ask questions about this as we go through, if you like. So normalisation, imagination and prioritisation, these are the real challenges. If these services, these fantastic innovations, aren't normalised through broader use in the external markets, they will never take off in the public sector. Imagination, we aren't necessarily the best at imagining the best way to use these products and services. We need assistance from our private sector partners to think through the lens of public sector organisations about how we can best use products and services in the right way. And then prioritisation. I talked about cost savings, I talked about value creation, that being key to kind of implementing and executing innovation within public sector. Saving a few quid on transaction processing costs doesn't shift any dials. So what is the broader value proposition that these technologies offer that are going to make public sector organisations sit up and work together collaboratively to enable working together to deliver the solutions? I shall get off my literal soapbox now and hand over. <laughs> Thank you so much and for bringing the energy as well. Um, uh, really interesting because I think with, when you hear you're going to have a speaker from the Crown Commercial Service, I think I was expecting it to be very much around how do you drive efficiencies kind of in that across the system. But really good to hear that you're also focusing on, well, how do you actually create those solutions that are going to help ultimately people um, in the public and especially the most vulnerable people um, in society. So really interesting to hear the way you talk about inclusion there and how some of the new technologies can become even more targeted in some of the solutions that we use. And then very interesting, I think, at the end, because already the technology is moving, so say, from the fuel cars to the EVs, what does that mean for the public sector in terms of how we keep up with that? And I think how we keep up with change is a very big issue for all of us in the public sector. Thank you so much, Lee. Sudansu, we're coming over to you. And I know there's loads going on in India on this. And, and also, just to say, I think this, this session, really interesting that payments cover so much. So I think we're going to get a lot of information here. Sudansu, for you. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, as we all know about the technology offers you know a lot of promises a lot of potentials for improving government payments both for the governments and its departments or government owned undertakings uh, which disperse benefits in the form of subsidies to its citizens or salary payments to its employees or disbursing dividends and pension payments etc and also for the general public citizens and the corporate businesses to make various types of payments to the government so such benefits could be in the nature of uh, all this seven to eight benefits which you see that digital payments are much more efficient than the traditional cash based payments or paper based payments they are fast and cost effective basically the digital payments they reduce intermediaries in the government transaction payment transaction chain and enable fast and direct credit to the beneficiary's account at a lower cost uh, as far as transparency and corruption free we know all payment transactions digital payments they they leave an audit trail for each transaction and each payment could be tracked to the end use so it enables transparency and also curbs you know corruption and inculcates accountability it also enables financial inclusion by providing the general public broader access to the formal financial infrastructure and also provides history of the transactions which a customer has done from his account so this information could be used by the especially the rural population or for that matter not very well to do, to do people to use this information to access mainstream other banking services such as your uh, uh, credits your deposits and also help the banks to take credit decisions on the basis of this information mm -hmm. now safe and secure payments uh, reserve bank of india has taken a lot of measures in building safety and security in payment transactions so that the consumers have satisfactory level of confidence in the digital payment ecosystem there are various measures which uh, we, we have taken i'm not going through them uh, we can talk if if there is a question on it uh, digital payments also enable targeted government payments and also aid disbursements to the vulnerable sections of the society uh, it it also offers a laws you know timely economic relief to the affected population such as in the covid 19 pandemic this was targeted and timely economic relief was you know provided to the citizens the needy people and the rural populations uh, and benefits in uh, in respect of the various government schemes which we have in india they are mostly targeted largely targeted to the women members of the family it gives them the the decision making capability to handle the family spending now let me tell you something about the infrastructure which india has built based on, upon uh, which is being leveraged for making various types of digital payments now we call it as digital public infrastructure uh, this is basically an ecosystem which is built in the public interest uh, uh, with the goal for addressing the societal challenges and which leverages the competitive dig uh, the private innovation it uh, basically it is it is the platform such as digital identification payment infrastructure or data exchange solution which can be used by various countries to deliver essential services to the needy people empowering the citizens and making them included the in a sense uh, digital public infrastructure it's basically it mediates the flow of people flow of money and flow of information flow of people is done through the digital id system which we in india we have we call it as aadhaar aadhaar is basically a 12 digit unique identity identity number which is allotted to each citizen of the country uh, next is a, a flow of money that is done through real time fast payment systems we have upi which we call unified payments interface it is the india's real time fast payment system which enables 
the customers to make real time person to person and person to merchant payments using the beneficiary ids which are essentially in the nature of uh, email ids it's a, it's a virtual address which is in the form of text or, and also could be embedded in the form of qr code so uh, if we see this upi payment system in a, on a monthly basis there are more than 13.44 billion transactions which are processed amounting to 238 billion us dollars uh, which actually constitutes about 81% in terms of volume of the total digital payment transactions in india and 7.7% .7 in terms of value uh, on a da daily basis if we see there are more than 434 million transactions being processed by UPI, amounting to around 8 billion US dollars. And on a per second basis, if you see, around uh, 5,000 transactions are being processed, amounting to 90,000 US dollars. So it, this UPI, this is being seen as a digital public good in India because of the convenience it offers, because of the safety and security it offers to the customers, and with the click of a button, you can initiate a payment transfer and it will happen. The third uh, uh, infrastructure, the foundational infrastructure what we have built is, it's about data sharing mechanism, data sharing system, that is called account aggregator. So account aggregator is basically, it helps the individuals to check securely and digitally access and share information from the one financial institution where he maintains account with other regulated financial institutions which are there on the account aggregator network. So essentially, account aggregator network is a data exchange, data sharing system based on consent given by the individuals. And that will uh, help the individuals to access, as I said, other banking services and also help the uh, banks and the lending uh, fintechs they, to, to actually in expand their pool of customers. So uh, all these India, through the India stack, they, it, has, it has become the first country to actually build the foundational digital public infrastructure. Now, over on, uh, on this digital public infrastructure, we have various payment systems which are using this infrastructure to make payments. Now, let me tell you something about the various payment systems which government uses to make disbursements to its uh, public, to its citizens in the form of benefits and subsidies under its various programs. The first one is about NACH, if you see N-A-C-H, that is National Automated Clearing House, which is a web-based solution to facilitate end-to-end -end processing of interbank high volume transactions, which are repetitive and periodic in nature. So it basically, it is meant for banks, it's meant for corporates and governments to use this system to make disbursements to various customers for, uh, say, for, for uh, distribution of uh, su uh, subsidies, distribution of dividends, salaries, interest payments, etc. And also for, to collect various types of payments from other customers, such as bill payments, uh, which are relating to, say, telephone payments or electricity payments, or uh, for gas, water connections, et cetera, or loan, loan repayments, or for mutual fund insurance premium, et cetera, by, on the basis of the mandates given by the customers. So this NACH system basically has two variants, NACH credit, where you debit one account, that is the user institution's account, and credit large number of customers. Same way, it's, uh, NACH debit is opposite to NACH credit, where you cre debit a large number of custo customers' account and credit a single account for collecting various types of bill payments. Uh, another system what we have is APBS, that is Aadhaar Payment Bridge System. This is a unique payment system which uses Aadhaar number as the central key 
for electronically channelizing the government payments and subsidies and the benefits under its direct, direct benefit transfer program to the Aadhaar based enabled accounts of the intended beneficiaries. In India, whenever a customer opens a bank account, he is mandated or he is asked to link his Aadhaar, unique identity number, that is the Aadhaar number, with his bank account. So, uh, so that's the way Aadhaar enabled bank account it is called. And uh, APBS is actually, it uses the Aadhaar number to remit, to transfer various types of payments from the government. So the most important uh, uh, user of this APBS is the government and its agencies for uh, transferring the various the, uh, you know, subsidies or benefits under its various programs. Now, uh, another uh, AEPS is the Aadhaar Enabled Payment System. Basically, it is, it is a payment system which enables the customer, especially in the rural areas and the semi-urban areas, to use his Aadhaar number to access his Aadhaar-enabled bank account and carry out various financial and uh, non-financial uh, you know, services. So he just has to put his actually Aadhaar, uh, I just want to tell you Aadhaar number is a 12 digit number, it is based on the biometric information of the customer. And biometric information of the customer is all 10 digit, uh, 10 finger print, two iris print and the photo of the customer. So Aadhaar Enable Payment System, it uses Aadhaar number and biometric authentication of the customer to enable him to make any payment using Aadhaar Enable Payment System. And another, uh, you know, payment system, what we have is e-rupee. E-rupee is basically a prepaid digital voucher, which is primarily presently used by government and its departments uh, for some purpose, person-specific or purpose-specific payments. So this was issued at the time, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these vouchers were issued to the customers for you know, uh, vaccination purposes. So he can, uh, if the, the rural customers or the not well-to-do customers, they were given these vouchers to access, to get them, uh, themselves vaccinated using the, uh, you know, prepaid amount which is there on the voucher. Now, there are various other payment systems where, which enable the customers to make various types of government payments. These are UPI, uh, as I have already talked about, the other payment system is Bharat Bill Payment System, which is an integrated bill payment system which enables interoperable bill payment services to its customers using various types of payment modes as well as uh, various uh, uh, retail uh, uh, sorry, agents locations to, to help them to make payments. So, Dantia, I'm just conscious we definitely need to get time in for questions. So, yeah. maybe one more minute. Thanks. So, uh, card, PPI, net banking, all of you are aware. Uh, now, let me tell you something about barriers and uh, innovations in government payments. The, these barriers are, are especially in India uh, because, the, you know, for making, uh, for adoption in government payments or for any other payments uh, for that matter, People are very comfortable in using cash. They don't want to use uh, digital payments because of lack of trust in digital payments, though there are not much you know, fraudulent transactions which are being reported as compared to uh, uh, other jurisdictions. The for fraud to sales ratio is just 0.002%. Uh, so uh, still the, there is a lack of trust. There is limited digital light literacy Digital divide is actually playing a, a role which we are trying to address this through various other use cases. There are uh, some lack of sufficient digital payment infrastructure which we are addressing through creating a payment infrastructure development fund which actually incentivizes in the form of subsidies to deploy various payment access points, especially in the rural and semi-urban areas. 
we are also working on making some efficient customer grievance redressal mechanism as far as e-payments or digital payments are concerned. The frauds, as I said, uh, that is one more barrier which uh, create lack of trust in the digital payments. The innovations what we are actually, uh, actually having in, uh, for towards government payments, the central bank digital currency, we are uh, running a pilot. Uh, we are also trying to uh, build on some certain additional features on CBDC, that is programmability and offline capability. So programmability will enable uh, the governments and uh, other individuals also to make person-specific or purpose-specific payments. And offline capability will help them uh, to enable financial inclusion to in areas where there are issues in internet connectivity or there, there is poor or uh, no connectivity. And e rupee, we are trying to, uh, you know, make it available for all individual corporates and, of course, governments would be there. That's Thank you it. so much, Sudansu. I knew there was a lot to cover, and you've done a very good job of trying to uh, summarise it all there for us. And it is incredible in terms of the scale, just the numbers that you are throwing out, and how many people. And I think you have nearly two billion people now on the Aadhaar system, which is quite, uh, you know, a lot when you're coming from uh, smaller countries. Very quick question from me, because you mentioned there some of the challenges, and I just wondered whether there were any challenges that you recognised from the system in, uh, you know, in Italy. Are there similar challenges in terms of trust in particular, people not trusting maybe a digital system from a government? I would say that we don't have this problem. The main problem, uh, the problems are not so much on the citizen side, than on the public administration side and so on the competences to run mm. and to, uh, to be integrated in the system. And was your system in place during COVID as well and did you use it at all for notifying people about COVID? Let's say our um, EO app I mentioned was used to, uh, for the Green Pass. So the Green Pass was installed on the EO uh -huh. app and you could present it uh, as a as we prove, we have up today we have over 38 million so downloads of this application, and uh, I, be, I believe that this is the real centre of, of all our infrastructure. Okay, brilliant. And then, Lee, my final question to you before I throw open to the um, audience again, one of I think digital literacy and that digital divide that Zidansu mentioned. mentioned. Do you think, from the government point of view, they would like to do all the kind of payments out? digitally because it's very efficient but you're saying as well you need to make sure that you don't leave people behind so yeah ab absolutely i think there's a desire to be innovative but it's all about value as opposed to the kind of cost efficiency that we naturally associate with with innovation so not just about leaving people behind but it's the quality of service and actually is innovation about choice is it about cost efficiency is it about inclusion accessibility it should be about them all uh, and it might not just be one product or service it's about understanding the outcomes that we're looking to achieve and actually what is the right thing to deliver the best outcome for the citizen in this instance in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So you talked earlier about expecting, I guess, me to talk about procurement, um, being Crown Commercial Service, but we are procuring public sector services, so we have to focus on ultimately the end recipient and the outcomes. Mm. And just interesting then in India, what you said was actually if you can get people into the digital system, and get them a digital ID and maybe a bank account, that opens them up to other financial services that maybe they didn't have access to previously. So. Brilliant, thank you so much for our speakers. Who would like to kick off uh, with the first question? Anything to, yes, we have down here, if we could get the microphone down here, that would be great. Thanks. Hi, thanks very much for the presentation. Lee, can I ask you, are you involved with the Rural Payments Agency there in the UK? To an extent, they are a customer of, of Crown Commercial Service, yes. Okay, um, and then uh, the follow-up question I had was, um, and this is a little bit slanted for a business uh, idea, uh, I'm on the board of a company which provides uh, fleet cards and um, money to EV fleets and all the rest. Do you provide those cards yourself or do you go to the market and find providers? So we have, we have a, a legacy framework in place that we're likely to, um, that we are going to go back out to market for, start the process later in the year. So we go through a range of different private sector providers who provide fuel cards for us. So it's a government framework. That opportunity will be coming up again, so you can talk to us about that. And then we're looking concurrently about what we do in the, 
in the EV space predominantly, how we're going to pay for that moving forward as we transition our fleet. So, yeah, happy to have follow-up conversations about that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes, Ian down here. And then do we have any other questions at the back of the room? Thank you, Vaughan. Um, really interested to see on Sidanchi's final slide the word programmable money. And, Lee, when you were talking about closed-loop vouchers, it, it struck me as similar. And I know programmable money's become a bit controversial, I think, in the European Central Bank context with a potential digital euro, where the European Central Bank have said, we will not make a digital euro, I think I've got this right, programmable, but they use the word conditional payments or something like that. But am, am I, because Sidanchu has mentioned that word programmable money and it does seem to be a trend, is, is that something, is the closed loop system that or, or is it it's some, something no, no, you're no, engaged no. with? No, it's about function and purpose in terms of closed loop. So ultimately, where we're trying to drive a, a specific behaviour or set of actions. So essentially, you could issue a card with funds on and somebody could use that digital card and use those funds for whatever that's open loop this is really simple language closed loop being if actually we're trying to drive a particular policy so trying to make sure that we get money into the hands of vulnerable families to pay for food for their kids then actually we're going to issue a voucher for supermarkets specifically so the purpose within which or the mechanism that they can use those funds is closed in effect so yes, that, that's what I meant by, by closed in that space. Yeah. Probably, uh, probably it, this could be in the nature of prepaid payment instruments. Absolutely. So uh, you could have closed loop prepaid payment instruments where it can be used by the issuer uh, for using the services by the issuer, given by the issuer. And it's uh, open loop would be uh, for any other uh, you know, services given by any other entity. And you uh, enable this PPI, uh, uh, we call it a prepaid payment instrument, to be used at any merchant locations. Does that answer you? So think gift card, Ian. I don't know if you can hear yeah. me there. Think a gift card, and the gift card's yeah. for a specific place. Yeah. That's what okay. we're talking about. So making sure that it is locked down for a specific usage. You know, there are all sorts of lockdown mechanisms in other payments, but that, that's what I was referring to. Um, and, and I had a question as well to all of you, I think, which was on the, you mentioned the services have to be secure for people to trust them, they need to be safe. And obviously Aadhaar is a, a unique digital identifier. So does having that digital ID make your system safer than they were before, do you think? And also, I wasn't sure whether your system was also linked to a digital ID yes, system. But it's not the bank account, it's the uh, fiscal code. Okay. So we have uh, 13 digits fiscal code, which is unique for each person and which is the base for any interaction uh, of the all, we for payments, but on, not only for payments, for all the uh, data hub and so on. Okay. And, and you were saying that the Aadhaar is, is it's a code, but based on biometrics. Was that right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, once they, the entity, there is a government entity separately uh, instituted for this, uh, they issue Aadhaar number based on the biometric information of the customer, which are in the nature of, I said, 10 fingerprints, <coughs> two iris print, and the photo of the customer. Mm -hmm. So all are linked to that Aadhaar. And when we allow any payment systems to use Aadhaar as an identifier, so when you, they put an Aadhaar number, uh, uh, so if a customer is using the Aadhaar number to access his Aadhaar enabled bank account, he'll put his thumb, that goes to the institution which manages the Aadhaar number, it authenticates that transaction with the biometrics of the customer and gives a success sign and the transaction goes through. Okay. And all of that makes the system quite secure, secure I imagine. Yeah. And I'm going to end with a final controversial question to Lee then. Coming from the UK, where we don't have a digital ID system, would you like to see some kind of digital ID system Is this developed? a personal opinion as opposed to the opinion yes, of the UK Chatham government? Yes, it's Chatham House about, Rules uh, and nobody's tweeting that's out. Chatham House Rules is just <laughs> going to be online. Um, <laughs> um, I think, it, yeah, an identifier which enables us to securely access services is a positive thing 
in my opinion. Now, clearly within the uh, caveat, uh, clearly within the UK, we've we've looked at digital identities and we've had significant challenges around that in terms of you know the purpose and function of that. So, and, and I understand that. So, I'm not going to get into the debate around that. Do I think a digital ID would be useful in enabling access and inclusion within specific services? Absolutely. Personal opinion, I do. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Look at that. We are exactly on time and there was so much to cover there. We, we are going into another session now, but I think you will all be around when we get to the coffee break. So if people have questions about anything to do with payments, then please do uh, speak to our speakers when we get to our coffee break. Thank you so much to Alessandro, to Lee and to Sudanshu. Thank you. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs>